Thanks for tuning in to the Illuminations Podcast. We love having you here. It is our mission to be a beacon of light on your journey towards conscious and mindful living. In our weekly episode, we bring you inspiring change makers in the field of spirituality, healing, personal growth, and wellness who share their insight and expertise so you can navigate your way to a happier, healthier, and more purposeful life. Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of Illuminations World Podcast. My name is Nia Roy, and I'm your host for today and for all the other episodes. So today we have a new guest with us with a new topic, and his name is Arslan Al Hashimi. Arslan is a transformative performance coach and he is here with us today to talk to us about how positivity can boost your productivity. And just to tell you a little bit about Arslan, he helps people to transform chronic stress to joy and freedom. So welcome to the show, Arslan. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited. <laughs> So we were talking a little bit about what you do and, and the work that you do before we started recording. So I just want, wanted to ask you again, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, um, what, what, what you were doing before, and how did you get into this industry and doing what you're doing now, and, and why? So um, my background um, has always been um, or at least the background I like to talk about that's kind of led to what I do right now has always been um, labeled as a high achiever. Um, since the age of about 12 years old, I was already playing um, sports professionally. Um, I represented my country, MN, and the UAE in international squash competitions. I was one of the best players in the region. Um, and then I kind of went on to go to university, switched sports, played volleyball and beach volleyball, and NCAA and first division over there. Um, and then I came back and started working for the government. And um, I, um, by the age of 29, I was already a senior advisor in the government of Abu Dhabi to a few ministers in a row. And then um, uh, the circumstances at that time made me leave the government. And then I started working for car corporate and I was the general manager for the number one film production company in the world, corporate film production company in the world. I started there, I opened their office here and ran their business in the Middle East for about five years. Um, and then I stopped doing that and I decided to do Ironman races. So I did triathlons and Ironman for about five years, completely dedicated my life to that, to be the first Yemeni Ironman athlete actually. And so um, the reason why I kind of specialize in performance is because I've always been a performer, a high performer at very high levels. And after the last um, Ironman race I had, which was in Dubai, half Ironman race, I um, hit rock bottom um, from um, all the quote unquote um, mental and physical diseases that are associated with burnout. Um, so I got diagnosed with adrenal fatigue stage three. Um, I uh, got diagnosed with bipolarism, with um, chronic depression and things like that, that I never even, that never even kind of surfaced to my consciousness ever. Um, it was, it was very dark moments to be very honest with you. I was, I was in a, I was in a very dark hole that I needed to kind of crawl out of and, um, um, traditional uh, medicine um, wasn't able, to, first of all, to identify what was wrong with me, and second of all, couldn't tell me what was the source of it. What is something that I talk about? What's the root cause of the problem? Mm. So I went on my own adventure and journey to kind of cure myself and find my way out of this black hole. I was married and we're thinking about having a kid and all of that stuff, and I was like, I mean, to tell you that there were dark moments where I was thinking of kind of ending it all because I couldn't find a way out was the reason why I started thinking, okay, I've never had thoughts like that before, you know? Wow. Never acted on anything, but there were these thoughts that I understand now with working with a lot of clients, especially after COVID and stuff like that, there are these thoughts that creep up, you know? And, um, and so I started my journey, 
wanted to learn with the best anywhere, everywhere I can, traveled around the world, learning with the best. Um, I learned with people like um, Dr. Joe Dispenza, um, uh, some of the best hypnotherapists known um, to us right now in the field of hypnotherapy. Um, uh, I did a lot of coaching, coaching certificates, everything from health coaching, life coaching, hypnotherapy, NLP, relationship coaching, all of that stuff, um, just to understand how I can approach number one performance uh, at an elite level um, holistically, mm. but at the same time not cause burnout. And that's why I call it joy, because I started realizing that the antidote of burnout is joy. Because if you are enjoying what you're doing on mm. a daily basis, moment to moment, that is the perfect antidote to struggling with these things and, and ending up where I was. Wow. Yeah. What a story. Because because from the very simple and concise description that you've given me, which is trans helping people transform chronic, st chronic stress to joy and freedom... I had no idea that it had such a deep story behind it. Yeah. So I really, really am curious to know, how did you pave that path to positivity from that deep hole that you were in? So you mentioned you learned with a couple of people, but to put it in simple terms, what what did you do and, and how did you walk that path and how did you pull yourself out of it i mean i think it, it, everything we were having conversation with this i'm i'm a very big um uh, proponent of setting intentions and real pure intentions mm. and i think sometimes these intentions get set naturally without you even knowing so for me there was a point where i was like okay i just don't want to feel like this anymore you mm. know and it was such a pure intention that set me off on this journey and to be very honest with you, it was work, just every day working on different aspects of my life of, I call it the seven pillars of life mastery. So that's one of the, mm. one of the programs I've, I've kind of created. Um, but even discovering these seven pillars was a journey. So first it was nutrition and then it was assessing how I was movement, moving and exercising because I came from the Ironman thing. I don't know mm. if you remember or not. Mm. The thought of why was I even doing it? Was it coming from joy or was it coming from something else? And it was coming from something else. So um, the, like you said, the intention behind it. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So I started revising all these things and the more, and this took years, yeah, I'm not talking about months or, mm. or it took years and years and years. And every time I'd come across something, um, I'm a bit um, obsessive when it comes to knowledge. So every time I would come across something that's kind of bothering me deep down inside, I'd want to learn about it mm. just to get information. Um, and so just went across all these seven pillars and slowly started educating myself, getting degrees, getting um, certified, all of that, so that I can understand this trinity of uh, mind, body, and soul. So what I do has a lot to do with mind and mm. the body, but also a very spiritual side to what I do. And it's kind of a pragmatic way of looking at all these things to help um, high achievers and high performers to achieve at the highest level yet yeah. at the same time not have to experience go through what I went through because what I didn't mention is all these steps the reason why I mentioned them so um, being an athlete as, yeah. a, as, a, as, a, as a junior and then slowly going to school coming back working for the government working for corporate between every single one of them and through this journey and every single one of them, I've had severe burnouts. I just didn't know mm. that's what it was. So, so almost, it was like a normal, it was just yeah. a norm for you and yeah. you had no idea. Yes, absolutely. I mean, if you talk to every, if I talk to any high achiever and high performer and I tell them about my story, they'll be like, oh, wait, w wait a minute. That's exactly how we felt throughout our journey. We had these severe ups and severe downs and mm. severe ups and severe downs. And to me, that is a subconscious manifestation of really deep things that you haven't sorted out, and you're uh, you're you're manifesting that consciously for you to be able to, to 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 figure these things out, right? Would you like to share when when you mentioned you were trying to when you were trying to look at what your intention was for wanting to do all of that? What was that intention for you? 
like for to 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 be that high achiever i mean there were each one of them uh, they of, of course all had a common thread at a very kind of unconscious subconscious level um but you'll find a common thread between me and most high achievers is that we're taught that our worthiness is attached to our achievements mm. right so i remember there's no blame whatsoever but i remember when i was a kid if i'd come up with a 95% my dad would tell me why didn't you get 100 you know and it was always the shaming of this person is doing really well this person is doing well why can't you do the same and it's so hardwired from such a young age yeah of course i mean we're all hardwired that way i mean if you think the statistics are something like 90% of all people on earth right now are chronically stressed to a certain level or a certain degree right yeah that's because we're all brought up this way we're brought up into into this rat race this machine that um assigns our value to our worthiness mm. our self-worthiness self-love that we receive at a very young age we learn at a very young age from the people that are teaching us about love right mm. um it's attached to our success and where we get so we're constantly chasing this dream and in reality how many people are going to be the number one squash player in asia <laughs> like one you know and there are about what you know, hundred thousand <laughs> to hundred thousand trying and failing, you know, yeah. in their mind. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we're we're all programmed this way. It's not just me. So once you make or once you identify that, you know what, this is this is uh, where it's coming from, or this is how, or where this drive to be a high achiever is coming from, and now you want to change that or rewire that. How much does motivation and how much does discipline now play in this whole transformative part or the, the healing part or the unwiring part of the whole thing? It's, it's very difficult to, to gauge these things. and kind of, because there's no one way that fits everybody, right? Um, it depends where you are um, in this level of, of recovery, let's call it that, mm -hmm. right? So if you're in, in a very dark, deep place, mm -hmm. your motivation and your intentions and your ability to work and sorry, these words that you're using, I kind of didn't, I yeah. forgot the words you're using. They're not the same as somebody that's already at 99% and wants to go to 100%. Absolutely, right? because you don't have them. If you're, if you're in a very deep hole, like you wouldn't find that motivation, yes. Yes. right? So how, so considering you were in a similar position, how did you find that motivation or I, I had to find my why i had to find my purpose the reason um that i could attach myself to that will pull me out of wherever i was so for me it was um remembering the old me mm. um versus where i was and how that was affecting everybody around me my wife my my career my all these things that were very important to me sports all of that stuff um and I think it's that moment where you understand it's you rather than being a victim to the circumstances around you yeah. is kind of, a it was a very big moment for me, a realization, as well as a lot of the clients I work with because as a natural protection mode of the ego, we kind of project our reasons for the way we're feeling negatively, whatever it is, to outside factors. And it's that moment where we realize it is an internal journey, an internal mm. um, uh, transformation mm. that will transform your outer world or your human experience is when we really start seeing things happen very quickly, actually. You know, people say it takes a very long time to transform. Actually, I've seen in front of my eyes in healing circles and stuff like that that I've done where people have been cured from stage three, stage four cancer instantly, mm. literally, in, a, in one meditation or in one practice. I've seen it in front of my eyes. You know, if you would have told me 20 years ago that is, that is something that happens, miracles, I would have been like, you know, no way. That's not something that, that, that happens in this time and day. It could happen in the Bible and the, in the Quran and mm -hmm. whatever, but it doesn't happen now. But it happens every day. People heal every day. That's amazing. You and know? I love what you mentioned earlier. It's, it's 
Because a lot of people can be stuck in this loop of being a victim, realizing that the only way you can get out of it is by choice and doing something about it, right? Mm. So on that note, how, and, and you mentioned you now help people do that when it comes to stress and, and so on. So tell us a little bit about what do you do now and who do you work with and what does that look like? So in brief, because what I do is quite long. Um, so in brief, what I do is I, um, first of all, through my own journey, my journey was doing this backwards, actually. But um, through, through my own journey, I realized that if we really want to help people transform themselves, and that's mm. key, right? I'm not transforming anybody. I'm not mm. doing anything. I'm not practicing any magic. All I'm doing is I'm allowing people to rise to their greatness mm. and heal or perform from inside out, mm. right? So I am kind of a guide more than, quote, unquote, a healer or anything like oh, that, that, right? I because that. I believe my core belief system is every human can heal themselves from anything, right? Yeah. So um, the journey is, first of all, removing the blocks that are blocking you from you being in homeostasis mm -hmm. or homeostasis is basically when all your body, your body and mind and soul are in um, coherence mm -hmm. and all your systems are working properly, your immune system, your reproductive system, your digestive system, everything is working 100% according to how you've been born, mm -hmm. right? Um so the reason why they wouldn't be is because something within you is blocking them. And it's sometimes a direct uh, message from your subconscious to you through these systems because your subconscious runs those too. Mm. So first removing the blocks because if you try to change, so the next step would be to work on the seven pillars of life mastery. So we assess every single pillar mm. and then we bring all of these pillars up to 100%. And I'm now an expert at all of them. So... Mm. Stuff like nutrition, movement, spirituality, relationships, uh, sleep and recovery, things like that. So I've gotten myself to um, be an expert at all of them and then create a way to for all of them to work. So let's say, for example, you're trying to lose weight. This is what you came to mm. see me for, or one of the things you came to see me for. And you're not able to lose weight. And you've been going through these yo-yo diets and you can't lose weight and you know, everybody goes through this right yeah. now. So first of all, if we don't address why you're not sticking to the routines and why you're not sticking to your nutrition and why aren't you loving yourself, because that's at the end of the day, that's an expression. If you're feeding yourself good food, then it's an expression of self-love. Mm. If you're constantly treating yourself in that way, it's an expression of somehow not having that kind of love that you're supposed to have for yourself. Mm. So if we understand the blockages that block you from you loving yourself, mm. then the route to making you lose weight becomes so much faster. Yeah. You know, instead of years, I've had people turn around in months, like yeah. just one or two months, completely shed the weight. And not even with these crazy, I don't believe, I've been through the mill, trust me. Like I'm the kind of person, I told you, I'm hardcore. I've been raw vegan. I've been, <laughs> like, uh, I've done like the craziest kind of diets because I'm a self hacker too. I'm a yeah. biohacker. So I've been, I tried all of them. And at the end of the day, I realized it's not about that. It's about being at peace with yourself uh, in a way. And all that weight kind of comes off because eventually all of these things people are asking you to do, you're going to do naturally. You're just not going to want to, you know, treat your temple, your body mm. badly. You're not going to want to have negative thoughts a lot. You're not going to want to, you know, allow these kind of programs to derail you from your, from your goals and achievements. So from... Your, because considering uh, you have an athletic background and now with all the work that you've done, how would you now bring in the impact of or the, the lessons of being an athlete and a coach? How would you now bring the concepts of that into being more positive and more productive, whether it's with work or with anything that you do? So there are certain foundations that allowed me to build what I have right now, the methods I have and all of that. Um, one of them, absolutely, um, is athleticism. Because as an athlete, um, 
you are at the uh, sorry i'm talking professional athlete you're mm. at the epitome of performance mm. right so at and you have lights on you and cameras on you mm. and now social media and all of that mm. stuff and i find from working with some professional athletes that i have that these concepts that we were just talking about are extremely um, uh, inflated with them. So, for example, as soon as an athlete misaligns their purpose mm -hmm. of why they're doing it, we see chronic injuries appearing and stuff like that, and, and it manifests in their lives very interesting, quickly. Interesting, very yeah. interesting. Yeah. I worked with an athlete, I'll give you an example. I worked with an athlete that had an, uh, um, uh, was preparing for a very big event, um, in their uh, athletic career and injured their shoulder and what we found out was they stopped being aligned with the love for their sport and they were being fueled with the anger and fear of their past wow right wow. and so they stopped having quote unquote joy right that's why i'm, I'm always talking about joy being the best driver for mm. performance it's not a hippy dippy kind of <laughs> you know people people think sometimes i talk about that and they're like oh you can't be happy all the time first of all it's not happiness it's joy it's a different kind of energy right um and if you want to think about it happiness is an extreme um version of that mm. joy is let's see seeing a child exploring something for the first time and how they're kind of excited about it that's how i feel joy is yeah and so as soon as we align this athlete with reasons for them to be joyful about what they do yeah everything changed and i was talking to you about this now mm. we're doing this with corporations we're yeah. doing this with multinationals i partner with some companies to deliver the spiritual aspect of athleticism mm. in the corporate world because if you can align yourself with a higher purpose a bigger why on a corporate level on a strategic level and disseminate that into everything you do <laughs> sorry i keep hitting this thing um then people will be happier you're going to be happier you're going to have a higher purpose and you know the universe and god whatever you f believe in is going to feed into that absolutely and i couldn't agree with you more because like you said this concept of happiness is to and joy is totally underestimated and and thought as like oh it's like all hippy dippy and and it's loosely used and you can never be happy all the time but it's such an essential part of living a day-to-day -day life and Absolutely. and your 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 well-being Absolutely. and i'm really curious to know about how you bring in the strategy of being more joyful and being more free into the corporate world how do you help the corporate world doing that you mentioned you look at their values but could you give us an example perhaps with uh, someone that you worked with or a company you worked with so uh, there aren't too many statistics here on how stress affects organizations but in america for example there are a lot of very um shocking statistics yeah. um on the amount of money uh, corporations spend because of chronic stress yeah. um how it affects uh, leaves, how it affects attendance, how Absolutely. it affects performance, and at the end of the day, the bottom line. Yeah. So this is not, as I said, a hippy-dippy approach. This is a strategic, calculated, measured approach mm. to how joy, which is, first of all, establish joy as the polar opposite of chronic stress, right? How joy as the polar opposite of chronic stress can add to their bottom line. Mm. And when we look from the bottom line up, there's all these plans and strategies that are being set up to mm. create that bottom line, right? Yeah. So if you can insert at the top level, at the highest level of governance in any organization, a spiritual aspect of why they're doing things mm. and how it can disseminate into all of their strategies, who they hire, how they train, um, how they speak to their customers, customer service, um, finance, mm. uh, all of that stuff, due diligence, uh, governance, all of these things that are extremely important to organizations, even the government, mm. right? When a government says, we're very concerned about it, or we're very, our our highest um, goal mm. is, the, is the happiness and the joy of our people. Mm. There is a strategic approach to that. It yeah. has to be in the highest level, at the presidential level, at the ministerial level, 
part of their values. Yeah. So you pick people that have that value within their, within their, within them, and there mm -hmm. are measurable ways to mm -hmm. disseminate or 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 extract mm -hmm. people's values when you interview them, for example, right? Yeah. And make sure, first of all, that you understand your values at a corporate level. Yeah. And then bring in the people that have the same values mm -hmm. within this. And what do you do about companies who probably have these top managers uh, who've been working there for many years, um, probably much older people? And like you said, you have to work from the top, right? But when they, when they say, well, um, we need to make profit... And, and when uh, you bring in the fact like, you know, uh, the values and all that things that you mentioned are also important. And when they don't see the value in that, how do you educate them or how do you implant that seed into them? How do you get that, through? That is the trick. I mean, as a coach, you're a coach mm -hmm. yourself. As a coach, you know, everybody has an individual approach and individual needs, and individual yeah. values. So there is no cookie cutter way to go and talk to corporations and say, these are your values, yeah. this is what you need to do. And this is what happens. I've seen it so many times. You know, this is this was my bread and butter, branding, brand strategy, stuff like that. And it doesn't work that way because if you don't have people at the top aligning with what you are, mm. uh, what you decided the strategy is going to be, yeah. it's always a top down kind of approach and mm. leadership, right? So... The trick is to bring in someone that is able to relay these messages that you're trying to re relay through the corporation mm. to every single one of these leaders and have turned them around. So it needs to be a systematic coaching approach at the top first for you to be able to convince them, bring them back into the fold. And trust me, no, at the end of the day, nobody's going to disagree with a higher bottom line. No one. Mm. If you can demonstrate to individuals that at the end of the day you're going to make more money and at that level at c-suite they do make more money mm. right the, most mm. of them aren't incentivized by salary mm. most of them are incentivized by you know yeah. profit margins at yeah. the end of the day yeah. so if you can convince them that this is going to affect the profit margins who's going to say no now Very yes true. there is an individual approach to every single one you know yeah. some people that were just different were built different yeah. and you can and sometimes i hate generalizing but sometimes you can generalize and feel like you know, the CFO is going to be one way, the COO mm. is going to be one way, the CEO mm. is going to be one way, hopefully, if they've selected the right people. Mm. And just having that knowledge and having had that experience and been in, you know, boardrooms and advising and stuff like that mm. helps, of course, 100%. It's, it's very hard to go and talk to these people if you don't understand where they've been and how they think and the stress they're under. Absolutely. And not only individually but i would also say culture plays a big role in this as well because uh i met because i also work for a, an indian company and i try to bring in these concept and it was so interesting to see the um the dissonance mm. with uh, what they think it, like they probably they thought it was all fluffy and mumbo and, jumbo, and mumbo <laughs> jumbo <laughs> happiness joy really <laughs> yeah. but whereas if you were to take it up with um let's say an american company they'd probably be very open to it uh, it depends <laughs> it depends again like this generalization is 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 tough because i know some indian companies that are very into this stuff into spirituality and how that you know, some some of them are even too much. You have to mm. kind of pull them back. You know, I would tell them, I told you, I'm very pragmatic. Mm. I'm not somebody where my mind is completely in the air and in the clouds. I'm somebody that takes high performers and high achievers and makes them perform at a very high level, right? So I have to be pragmatic. I tell people I have a I have a I have a spiritual genie sitting here <laughs> and a very pragmatic yeah. scientific genie sitting here. And this is just how I am built. If mm. I can't be convinced scientifically and spiritually of yeah. things, it just doesn't fly with me. And I understand that that's their approach too. Yes, it depends on the percentage, right? Some of them are not spiritual at all. Some of them are too spiritual. And so we have to bring them to a pragmatic way of looking at their career and their advancement and mm -hmm. the effect of people and the effect on the organization and leadership and empathetic leadership and all these buzzwords that everybody's talking about and how at the end of the day it affects, as I keep going back to that, mm -hmm. how it affects the company, how it affects the performance of the company. 
Absolutely. Right? So you you touched on a very important point. When you enter an organization as somebody like me that's trying to help them with that research about the company and their and their culture and their strategy and their planning is absolutely crucial at this beginning point to get the first win and the first intention mm-hmm. from them. If you can't present this individualized to them according to how their culture is, then you failed. Yeah. I can guarantee you that, right? So having that corporate background and government background and being able to speak the language and communicate the and articulate the, the strategies and the plans and all of that is absolutely crucial for you to succeed in convincing them. Absolutely. Right? And it's always that first um, impression. 100%. Right? So what would you say are some tips that you have for not only managers, but also employees in the company when it comes to taking the first step towards living a bit more joyful life or being a bit more free, being a little less stressed? What would be maybe your top five tips? Um, the, 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 let's say the result is joy, right? To get chronic joy in your life, it's a, it's a, it's a holistic approach. So you need to be pretty critical about your life as a whole. Right. A lot of, you know, when you go into these corporations, um, sorry, I'm going to I'm going to say this at the beginning just to explain what I'm going to say. But when you go into corporations and you talk to employees or you talk to high performers, it's always kind of taking career out of the context of your life. Hmm. Right. That is where the problem is. It's this mask that we have to wear everywhere. If I'm at work, I need to be this person. But when I'm at home, I need to be that person. And most people that have a an issue are people that are living multiple lives. That's so interesting. That is so well said. Right. Such yeah. a good point. Yeah. And that creates incoherence in you and your life and your happiness and stuff like that. So first of all, the first step would be, why are you doing this? And how can you bring it into the context of your life and just be yourself? How can you be yourself at work? That is so true. A lot of my clients come and they're so unhappy. I feel like I can't, especially a lot of people that work in governmental organizations and things like that come and say, I have to be this way. I can't be that way. You know, I can't be myself. And I'm like, have you ever tried? Most of them say no. They go back and they try and they're shocked at being accepted because in their minds, there's this tape playing that people told them or they were educated in their lives or stuff like that. You have to be a certain thing or person at work. And then later you can be somebody else. You can be yourself. Right. So the first is how can you bring these two kind of together? I'm pointing my two fingers mm. together for people. Can't <laughs> see that. How can you bring these two together? How can you align your career within your the context of your life? And are you saying that even people who hate what they do can come to that point? If you hate what you do, move. Right. Then you have to ask yourself, why, why? am I not? You know, again, we go back to the self-love thing. Why am I doing this to myself? What is in the background preventing me from thinking that if I leave here, I wouldn't have a better um, opportunity? I remember those days. I remember. I was stuck in a job that I hated. I'm not saying I've been like this my whole life. I told you. My whole career is defined. um, And, you know, a lot of what I do is all introspecting about the past and what I went through and how I felt. Mm. You know, one of the first jobs I had, I was in in a horrible situation. And I ended with it in a horrible situation. And I loved that job, right? But even later on, I was thinking, why didn't I leave? Like, why didn't I try to go somewhere else? I know I was really good. They know I was really good. The reason why I was being treated so badly was because I was good. And I was told that. You know, you're ruffling feathers. You're you're making people look bad and stuff like that. Because I'm, I, if I go somewhere, I want to change. I want to do things, you know. And mm. I was making a lot of people in a very dinosaur kind of, organization look bad and and they were very 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 influential people so they fought me hard and at the end of the day they got rid of me hard yeah you know and that i w- i went through a severe depression after that i had a debilitating backache for a year from that doctors couldn't figure out what it was i couldn't get off the couch so the reason why i'm saying that is even then i didn't know i d- didn't cross my mind that if i just let go and 
you know, believe in myself and love myself and treat myself well and believe that something better would come, mm. you know? So, so the first thing will be assessing if you're wearing that mask or, or m removing the whole career as a separate entity from your life, yes. basically. What will be a next step? The next step is to assess all the factors in your life. Are you, are you eating well? Are you mm -hmm. sleeping well? Are you, are you loving well? Like your family, your kids, um, is that feeding in and as well as you're giving out? Is, um, are, you, are you moving? Are you exercising? Are you all of these factors that we're talking you know, we're yeah. in social media. This stuff is like we're bombarded with every day. But there is truth to it. Yeah. Are you really, can you very simply put a pen and paper, write all these pillars. Like there are seven yeah. pillars. You can go on my website and you'll find them. Assess every single one of them and s give yourself a score. Zero to ten. Yeah. Zero the lowest and ten the highest. Then add them up and you're going to get a cumulative st score. This accumulative score is your success story. Right? If... And be very honest, mm. right? And eventually you will see, oh, okay, I'm not eating. Oh, I'm not eating when I'm working. Oh, I'm not. You're hangry. Mm. <laughs> you <know? laughs> you're, seriously, it, you will be shocked how many people turn around just by feeding themselves well at work. It's crazy. Wow. You know, it's insane. It's so just food. It's, it's, it's our, our, our mental well-being, our physical well-being, our spiritual well-being is dependent on what we feed ourselves. So assessing the pillars, looking at your work life, and when it comes to spirituality, or any practices or any any tips on how people can just get started or what can, what they can do. I think there are practices, uh, but what I start with is the foundations, which is what is my purpose? What am I here? Um, is that is what I'm doing on a, on seven pillars? Are those aligned with my purpose, mm. right? Um, and you'll definitely find things. Even people that are well practiced, like me, like you, whatever. You, it's very important to always go back and reassess. You know, um, so assess all of these things according to w your your purpose in life, and, right? And what if you don't know what your purpose is, or you're in a position where yes, you want to move forward, but you just don't know? Find someone that will help you. There are many people that will help you. You know, there are many coaches, there are many spiritual leaders, there are whatever angle you feel like that will feed your soul and extract it. Find someone. It's it's not I, mean, I had to I had to find coaches and teachers all over the world to get me from where and I still do. I have like I have four coaches as I'm going. If I'm a coach that doesn't have coaches, <laughs> then there's something wrong, <laughs> right? I have coaches. I'm Absolutely. constantly being coached. I'm constantly growing. I'm constantly looking to 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 love myself even more and stuff so find help i mean this is another thing in the corporate world is that people feel like there's a taboo about going to find help still until today people like i'd ask people for testimonials and they'll tell me oh don't mention my name you know because there's still a taboo mm -hmm. and especially in our region you find help there's, there's no there's no um People have to start breaking that paradigm. So thank you so much, Arsalan, for being with me here today. I think it truly was such an insightful conversation. Okay. I learned a lot and I'm sure the, the listeners did as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, before we leave, any last words? Um, no, I mean, I think the ultimate, uh, the ultimate purpose of why we're here is to learn how to love ourselves even more and that projects to um, loving on the external and loving more so just every day try to find ways to love yourself more that's just the way i i do things and and, and wish for people thank you so much arsalan and thank you to all the listeners who are listening to our conversation right now and uh, just another reminder for living well and eating well and <laughs> uh, you can find me here at illuminations and you can find arslan um on his 
Instagram page as well. I'll tag him uh, in our stories. Until next time, take care and listen. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, we'd love to have you tune in again next week as we discuss more engaging topics on relationships, health, career, self-care, and spirituality. If you'd like to help support this podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave us a rating and review. We'd be extremely grateful. To catch all the latest from us, you can also follow us on Instagram at Illuminations World or visit the Illuminations World YouTube channel for more inspiring content. See you again next week and until then, live light. Live light.